welcome Joel Christopher Payne. me. She said that uh, you guys regularly have inspirational speakers that come in and talk to you uh, about, about their careers, right? Yes. Try to inspire you. Uh, so I, I have uh, 30 minutes, so I figured I'd set my little timer here for 25 so I can allow five minutes for questions, because you're probably going to have some after I tell you what, what I've been through. So I'm going to set my timer right now, since it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a 30 second pitch. I don't want to go over. <laughs> so. Uh, I'm going to inspire you by telling you about my life. Um, so I, I, as you heard, I grew up in Temple City, but I actually uh, started my life uh, on Rosemead Boulevard. We had a, a house on Rosemead, and it had uh, bats in the backyard and rats in the front yard. I was born <laughs> completely poor. <laughs> uh, I remember laying down as a kid. Uh, you know, I was four years old, I could lay down in my kitchen and I could touch one wall with my feet and the other wall with my hands. That's how tiny our <laughs> kitchen was. So you can imagine, uh, that, was, that was definitely humble beginnings. Uh, going to kindergarten, uh, I'm, a, I'm a white boy and I was growing up in a mostly Hispanic community uh, in Rosemead. So I got beat up a lot. <laughs> oh yeah, from kindergarten all the way to high school, I was bullied. Uh, even when I was going to TC, it was, it was predominantly white. You know, I, I was the skinny, awkward, nerdy kid. You know, uh, so I, I I didn't do too well in school. I got D's and F's, mostly. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I don't even know how I got through high school. I don't know how I how I graduated. Are we inspired yet? <laughs> uh, well, um, but I was an artist. Uh, I would use art to escape. I, I used it to escape my life, basically. Uh, it, it, it gave me happiness to kind of draw worlds that I can, I can go to. And, and it, there were no limitations, you know? I didn't have anybody putting me in a little box or a locker, which did happen to me, actually. Uh, <laughs> so just, just growing up, having the only talent that I had, which was art, uh, when I got into, into college, it was then that I discovered, because uh, we really didn't know too much about this, that I had uh, severe dyslexia. Uh, I had a, a adult attention deficit disorder, so I might, I might get a little distracted today. Uh, and, and OCD, which you would think are, are pretty bad you know, complications. But each one of those things, actually, I turned into a positive, and I'll tell you how I did that. So I was uh, working in Pasadena. There was this company called Somewhere in Time. They had a little costume shop on, on Colorado Boulevard. <coughs> Applied for a job, got it. Was making masks and uh, dealing with costumes for the movie business because I really wanted to go in the film business, be a, a director like Steven Spielberg. Uh, and then when I, when I turned 21, I, I got my break in, in the uh, video game industry. But right before that, I was so wanting to go in the film business and be a director like Spielberg, because I saw, I saw E.T. and I just wanted to do it. <laughs> so I got a book on who's who in Hollywood. That's what I did. I went to the, I went to the bookstore, got a who's who in Hollywood, and I looked up Amblin, because that's you know, Steven Spielberg's company, and I found an executive there, De Deborah Neumeyer. And she, she, I don't know what she did. She was an executive. That's all I knew. Got a year-round pass to, um, Universal Studios, snuck in the back lot of Universal Studios, and I had won the film festival at, uh, at Pasadena City College three years in a row. So I, I had my films under my arm, snuck back there. Uh, and there was a little entryway back in the day, this is before 9-11. <laughs> it's a lot easier to sneak back there. So I snuck back there, got past three security guards, uh, two secretaries, and an assistant to Deborah Neumeyer. I actually got through all of that and was right there. And I didn't know what I was going to say to this woman, but they, they got me on the phone with the assistant and they said, uh, Mr. Payne, we're going to have to uh, escort you off the lot. We have no idea how you got back here. <laughs> and I thought that was the end, right? But just as I was about to be escorted, Deborah Neumeyer comes out. I recognized her from her picture in the book. I'm like, Deborah! <laughs> Yeah, you don't know me at all, but uh, you came to my college and uh, you had a very inspirational speech. And uh, you know, I've got some films, and I just—I don't want a job. I just want your opinion of what these, what you know, what you think. They're only five minutes each, and I just want your opinion. It's like, well, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, 
I'm taking lunch, let's go look at it. So I went down in Steven Spielberg's <coughs> viewing theater, uh, private theater, and we watched my movies. And at the end of it, she said, you know, uh, I don't know how you got back in the lot, but you know, uh, you should just, you should, you should be a page, you know, seating people in the audiences and, and, and you'll be close to the action. If there's any job, you know, that pops up here, uh, we, we can, you know, you'll be right here and then you can legally come on the, on the back lot. So, um, so I did, I became a page and was seating people and that gave me a really awesome opportunity of finding out what I wanted to do. If I wanted to be a cameraman, I started talking to the cameraman. I wanted to be a writer, I started talking to the writer. I wanted to be a director, I started talking to the director. I was right there. Even though it was an entry level scenario, I was right there talking to the people that I, you know, that were the beginnings of my career. Uh, long story short, I found out later that she got in trouble for letting me wander off because apparently this is exactly how Steven Spielberg broke into the industry. <laughs> he actually snuck in the back lot of Universal Studios, dressed up in a suit, and pretended to be an executive as he took over a janitor's closet. <laughs> Very shocking. I mean, I had no, and she's like, she's, so I came back the, 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 um, the third year I was in college, I had a 35 millimeter film. Now I had the rights, you know, legal right to be on the lot, and I snuck back there, but they had to actually up the security. <laughs> <laughs> you know, after what I had done, uh, and I didn't know what I was going to do. So I was walking this long stretch, you know, this way they have these little golf golf courts, ca carts in the, in the back lot, because it's near miles walking through there, and there are people on bikes and golf courts. And I saw this guy walking on the other side of the road alongside me, dressed really nice. And I, we were walking in the same direction. After a while, I said, are you following me? And he says, are you following me? <laughs> I'm like, well, where are you headed? I'm headed to Amblin. Well, I'm headed to Amblin too. So I walked in with him straight through, straight through all this security because he actually turned out to be a major, major movie uh, director. I didn't know this at the time. <laughs> Just walked right in with him. And of course, Deborah Neumeyer uh, took my call and walked me right in. And she said, what do you want to do? And that's when I got a job on Jurassic Park. So. That was the beginning of the, of, of the end of my film career, because I, I worked on that and it went straight into the video game business. <laughs> and spent 28 years making video games, art directing. I thought, when I saw the movie Jurassic Park and I looked at it, I, I saw how amazing the CG was. I thought, man, if video games get to be like that someday, I could be the Spielberg of the video game business, right? So the reason why I'm telling you these things is because we're constantly running into obstacles. I mean, that's all that everything is, really, just obstacles, problems that come up. And, you know, when, when I didn't know what I was doing, I just kind of wandered around and kind of let, let life take me where it needed to go. But, but it, it was how I handled the problems that mattered, you know? And I learned that from Disney, you know? I started working with Disney, got to work with the Imagineers. I built a couple rides with them, the Virtual Jungle Cruise. Is, one of the longest virtual attractions ever in operation out in Disney Quest, Florida, until they, they demolished the building last year. But I, I was 25 years old, I'm 40, 47 now, so you can see how long it's been going on. And one of the things about Walt that really just impressed me was that uh, you know, he didn't graduate high school. He actually dropped out of high school to go and fight in the war. And uh, the war was over by the time he got there, but he was an ambulance driver. And he just had all this adversity going against him. They all thought he was crazy. They all thought he was a lunatic uh, for doing a feature-length, full-length film, you know, uh, as a cartoon, Snow White. We all know what happened there, but um, the same thing happened to him when he wanted to build a theme park. They all thought he was a lunatic. They said, you can't, you can't, you can't. He went to the experts, the supposed experts, and said, this is what I want to build. He's like, you can't even travel with this thing. You can't lift it up and travel like we can. You don't even have any of the bells and whistles, the, the carnival games that we make most of our money on. No one's gonna pay more than a dollar for a ride. Are you crazy? <laughs> so he had this, everybody that ever went, you know, they just went against him because they thought he was crazy, you know? And this is a guy with just no, no college, barely, you know, gra didn't graduate high school, um, was, was, you know, went through the depression and went through all of that had his first character stolen from him, you know, the, the lucky rabbit, that, that was actually, it wasn't a mouse that started it all, it was actually a lucky rabbit that started it all. And every single time that something hit him and kicked him in the teeth and knocked him down, it was how he reacted that mattered most, you know. So one of the things that I do that kind of gets me through uh, the day, because I've got a lot 
going on right now. Um, as I, I just, at the end of the day, I, it's a little mantra I do. I look at myself in the mirror and I ask myself this very simple question. Because you can't, you can lie to other people, but you can't lie to yourself. You know, at the end of the day, you could, you could try to fool other people with the facades that we put on the market, you know, but when you're looking at yourself deep in your eyes, you can't really trick yourself. So I say, did I do the very best that I could do today? Did I accomplish all the goals that I set out to achieve? And if the answer is yes, uh, then nobody can fault me. And, and you know what, you gotta give yourself a pass too, because we, we beat ourselves up. We're, we're our worst enemies, you know, we're the ones that criticize ourselves the most. And the criticisms are good. You know, it's important to ask yourself at the end of the day, did I, did I do the very best that I could do? Because if the answer is no, <laughs> You know, don't beat yourself up. Just know that that's what you put on the list tomorrow to get done. And so every single day, you know, I, I'm a single father, three kids. I've got two twin daughters. They're, they're seven now. My son's uh, nine years old. He was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma on his birthday this last year in March. He's fine. He's fine. But uh, being a single father, it, it was really kind of a challenge to try to figure out how to make a, you know, make a biz, do a business after I've been in the video game industry for such a long time. I've held 30 professional occupations at the highest level in the entertainment business. I've directed, I've done uh, live action direction in the video game business. I was the youngest director at age 25 uh, to build my own uh, 360 degree, two story green screen studio for the video game business. It was breakthrough at the time. Uh, voiceovers, animation, I taught myself how to animate, I taught myself 3D. I just I constantly learned everything. Even if it wasn't my job, I would get into a company and I would learn everything. I wouldn't limit myself because, you know, when I learned how to write music, I, 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 I got to score music for Steven Spielberg. I got to write music for Stan Winston. I've written music for 15 plays. One of them was in Pasadena and it was Wuthering Heights. It was the first American version of Wuthering Heights. We ran for 36 weeks, it was the longest running small theater production of, of, of that in history. <laughs> All because I decided to learn how to write music. So, you know, I took the OCD and the AD, you know, all these, all these problems, and I just, every time I would get frustrated or bored with something, I would learn and focus on another thing until I got bored with that, and then I just kind of, you know, I kept the plate spinning on all the different talents that I had until I, I rose to the, you know, not just, you know, being a jack of all trades, but I mastered all of those trades. Because it was just a passion for me. I loved doing it. It was a personal challenge to me to try to figure out how to, to, to do the best everything I could do so I could turn these things into money. Um, so when, 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 when I got a divorce, it was, it was definitely a traumatic day, uh, as, as all divorces would be. But, you know, it, it, it compelled me to create something really beautiful uh, with my career. So I've done a lot of art, done a lot of music, game design. Uh, you know, I'm an internationally known Disney fine artist, one of the most reordered artists Disney has now. I have the most contracts of any Disney artist, 3,500 artists, I just got the most. I've achieved a lot, but you know, when, when, when I had to deal with three kids alone, nobody helping me, that's really challenging. I mean, that's some sort of a death blow to most men, okay? So, so you know, my friends were all handing me these big fat books on how to take care of twins. I'm like, I'm changing diapers every hour. I don't have to do this, you know? It was very frustrating, you know? So, but I remembered something that Steven Spielberg had told me, because I got to talk and hang out directly with him. So I'm gonna give you guys his keys to his castle. I mean, this is gonna. This is the, like, probably the most valuable life lesson I've ever, I've ever gained from any of the experts. I mean, I've worked with Chuck Jones. I, I got to meet Bill Gates, uh, Steve Jobs. I've, I've gotten to meet all these amazing people, because uh, I, I, you know, Helen reached out to me. I got to be the Grand Marshal of, of Temple City uh, last year for the Camellia Festival. Great honor. Shortly after that, I, I was invited to China by the president and did a nine day tour over there, got to stay in the state room where Obama and Clinton stayed, a nine day tour um, and a peace tour on the project I'm, I'm about to tell you about. Um, got to speak at Harvard in April. Not bad for a guy that got D's and F's, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 
So uh, there I was struggling. So I'm going to tell you what Stephen told me, and it applies to how, how we look at everything, how we sell, how do we be the best sellers? So he had this vertical reality ride that he had come up with for GameWorks. It was over in uh, Ontario Mills, uh, one of the one of the ins installations. You had to have four stories, to, and it was one of the one of the GameWorks that had it. And it was this, this uh, thing, you get strapped into a chair. This is before Tower of Terror at Disneyland. You get strapped into a chair. There was four of them, a little gun on there. And you're in front of a four-story screen and you get shot up four stories. Except the designers didn't know what they were doing. They made this skyscraper and you can see inside. And I guess the point of the game was you'd have to shoot the bad guy that's robbing on each floor. And if you shot him, you go to the next floor. And then if you shot him on that floor, you go. But the thing never got past floor two because it was so difficult to hit him. So they, they asked me to come in and redesign it. I said, I'll only do it on one condition. Spielberg comes and talks to me directly and we figure this out man to man. Because I don't want this to be, because it was just me and two programmers. It was normally a team of 15 to do what me and two programmers did. But I said, if I'm going to put my, my uh, sanity, you know, in, in, in check, <laughs> you know, and make sure that I'm, I'm cool headed and we get this thing done right, I need to hear exactly what he was expecting. So he agreed to it, which kind of surprised me. I was a cold Hail Mary, but he came out and closed down GameWorks, and I, I said, so what were you thinking this thing would do? He said, well, you know, when I built, when I thought about the idea, I thought, that'd be really cool if these things were going up and down really fast. But, you know, it, it, like one up, one up, and it's <laughs> very boring. I said, give me a sec. So I thought this was a great opportunity to steal Steven Spielberg. <laughs> so I got my programmers for the next 20 minutes to program the chairs so that they would go up and down as fast as they possibly could. So I knew that would take some time. Time for me to pick Steven Spielberg's brain. So there I was, sitting with Steven, having cocktails. It's amazing. Dream come true for me. I mean, I told him I snuck back in the back lot and he remembers that happening. He's like, you're the guy? I had no idea. I'm like, look at me now. Here I am. See? Well, I said, Stephen, what do you think about when you're coming up with a project where you know that it's going to have the widest audience acceptance? The most people are going to love it. You know, when you're picking out scripts, how do you know? He's like, wow, no, nobody's ever asked me that question. Why should I tell you? <laughs> You, you want the keys of the castle, aren't you? I said, well, maybe some of this knowledge will rub off on me and I'll make a better ride for you. So I, that's a pretty good idea. <laughs> All right, I'll tell you. When I was a little boy, I loved science fiction movies. But at the time, all of the science fiction movies were scary. All of the aliens wanted to kill us or take us over or rake on you to death. One day as a little kid, he was watching a Twilight Zone episode. Maybe you know the one. And it was a call to serve man. And he thought, oh, finally, aliens that are coming here in peace. <laughs> and then at the end of the film, it's, he finds out it's a cookbook for man, you know, <clears throat> to serve man. And he just went out in the backyard of, he was living in Arizona in the middle of nowhere, you know, some ranch house or something like that. And you could see all the stars. And he walked up there and looked up and he said, man, all those stars, if there's aliens out there, there's gotta be a lot of aliens. Where's the happy, friendly, friendly alien? Kind of a little Freudian slip there. Where's the friendly alien? And he had this epiphany. He's like, I think there's a lot of people that feel the same way I do. Like, where's the happy, friendly alien movie? And he was like shooting movies or trains crashing, his little eight millimeter camera. So he started thinking about that. And years later, we got ET, you know? And it was a smash. Everybody loved it. I remember crying as a little kid. <laughs> I was in my dad's station wagon, and I'll never forget, I was crying. My dad looks back at me and says, He lived! What are you crying for? <laughs> he, was, he didn't die. <laughs> but he was so cute. He was so nice. You know, because we all connected with that character so much, you know? So he said, every major film, the top 50, follow this simple rule. There were things that people already wanted long before I came along and told that story. Let me give you some examples. Did any of you think maybe when your toys, when you left the room, the toys were still playing around without you? <laughs> Toy Story, pretty big mm -hmm. film, wouldn't you say? Well, what about when your parents are berating you because you didn't put your toys away? It would be nice to have a time machine, go back in time, find out what kind of parent, what kind of kids they were, right? 
fact, the future did pretty good, huh? Um, what about uh, the most translated book in history, the Bible? Wouldn't it be amazing if we found some of those artifacts for real and they were really powerful? It was legit, godly, you know, the Ark of the Covenant, you know, Indiana Jones. So I said, wait a second, Stephen, I worked on Titanic. And that's the biggest, greatest, most successful film in history. It's number one on the list. And nobody wants to be on a ship, everybody gonna die. Your, your philosophy falls apart on the most successful film. And he said, actually, that's my best example. How long did Jack know Rose before he was willing to die for her because he loved her so much? One day, two days? I bet there's a few girls that wanted that kind of man in their lives, you know? <laughs> Just a few. And it worked for the guys, too, because the guys were like, I bet, you know, I want to steal away the hot chick from the rich, snobby guy. I don't have money in my pocket. I could do that. You know, it, it just it catered to the men and the women, the young kids, and they, they desperately wanted that so much that they watched that movie over and over, over and over and over. So... I had this epiphany myself, and I, with my kids, I was sitting there, changing diapers every every half hour. It was just crazy, you know, pooplosions and all. It was just crazy. <laughs> horrible. I mean, people sending me big fat books, phone books. I mean, you've seen the like, you know, what to expect when expecting books. Has anybody ever read that book? Nope. No. <laughs> and I thought. Wow, I bet there's a lot of people like me that wonder where the heck the lifestyle brand is out there where every single product backs up my play as a parent. Like, where's the bed that maybe has instructions worked into the, into the design so it could, like, teach my kid how to make a bed? Where's the light switch cover that, like, glows and it's cool to, like, turn off the lights, you know? Where's the soap that when I put it back, I can put it back because it lights up? You know, now it's not all over the place, all you know, melting into this into the sink. And there just wasn't one. I I thought about it, and I thought there isn't a single TV show that I would even allow my kids to watch with me that's teaching family values and life lessons. So I created a network called Friendlyans for one two for one uh, two dollar fee. That's it, just one two dollar fee. You'll get access to cartoons that I've animated. I'm like a one-man Pixar, so I can, I can animate them, voice them. I can do everything from nuts to bolts in 3D. That teach children family values and life lessons using evidence-based research on the best way to solve kids' problems without any hidden religious or political agenda. That's the disclaimer. i got to put that in there. And I also ran across a guy that had some technology. A little $5 device that allows toys to talk to each other indefinitely at CD quality sound with the capacity of controlling robotics. Toy Story for real. And it can interact with these cartoons in real time. So now we've got a toy that can, can, can literally interact with the children. Be, when you want them to go to sleep, you know, and the bedtime stories are over, you've got a little buddy that will keep your kid company and tell them bedtime stories when you're pooped. And it can remind them to make their bed. And it can remind them to wash their hands and, and encourage and back up your play. It's kind of like Mary Poppins uh, in a digital form. So I launched the app uh, using uh, funding from my artwork. Uh, I bought some artwork here. If anybody wants a Valentine's Day gift, I'm actually giving away one of my proofs for half price and I've got some watercolors here that are original pieces of artwork. And this is how I, I funded myself. I funded it all through my fans that they bought my artwork and I put it into the into the coffers to build this app, which is basically just a facade that allows me to access all of the Vimeo videos. That's all it is. But it looks like Netflix. It looks like I spent $100,000 on something and I've got my own network. So I've got different shows on there and I'm, I'm producing new content. And uh, so that's how I did it. It's just, it's just about you know, figuring out how to solve problems, how we change the, the station in our head when we get frustrated. You know, there's so many times I got frustrated and angry with, with I'm, right now I'm angry, angry with Apple, you know, for example. It's taken six months to get the Apple iOS on, on there. We had one bug. We try to fix the bug. They won't approve it because they don't know what our shopping cart icon is. I'm like, you already approved the first version of the app. It's, it, it had the shopping. So little frustration. So you're going to get agitated when, when things don't go your way. But think of it like this. I've only got one minute left. Think of it like this. <laughs> when you're, when, imagine you're having an, a, your favorite song is on the radio, but it's an AM station. When you go through a tunnel, what happens? 
it goes out. Now, do we lose our minds? No, we just change the station to the FM, right? And then when we come out of the tunnel, we're beep bopping back to the song that we were playing before. So anytime something comes at you, you get shut down, like Walt Disney did countless times, thousands of times, he just changed the station. He never said nothing was impossible. He said, no, we can't do that, but maybe we could do it this way. And that's how he handled everything. And when you're thinking about, you know, how do you sell yourself to people, use Steven Spielberg's key to his castle. You got, there. <laughs> and on that note, goodbye. No. Uh, we've got five minutes left, but, but use Stephen's advice. He thought, what are people already wanting long before you came along and tried to sell it to them? That's like amazing advice. Because it, instead of like trying to sell to the niche, you're selling to the, to, the, to the emotional satisfaction of this is what they already wanted. It takes all the work out of selling something if you're already selling to some, somebody that already was thinking that that's what they wanted in their head. So I know there's a lot of parents that are desperate right now for some kind of positive content that gets kids working together peacefully, despite our differences, <laughs> solving any problem that we face in humanity. And uh, it's kind of like I'm on a mission to cause world peace. And maybe that's a bold statement, but at the end of it, if I fall short, even a little short of it, at least I've done something that I can feel completely good about. And, and even with marketing, I'm using, I'm not even using marketing money. I'm finding people that are on-air personalities that have three million, four million fans, and I'm saying, hey, I'll turn you into one of my 3D cartoon characters. We'll find something that you like, that you want to teach kids. It'll take you 20 minutes to read this two-minute script. And all I ask is that you talk about it. Free, free marketing. Um, there's a really good book that I learned all this stuff from called Influence. You can buy it for like nine bucks on Amazon. And it's all these amazing studies about why people buy things that they don't necessarily immediately want all kinds of amazing things in their studies that they've done, the art of reciprocation and, and, and just ways of influencing people to get them. It's a really, really good book. So on that note, I, I've worked on video games, Mortal Kombat, Shaolin Monks, TV shows, movies, motion-based rides, traditional rides with Imagineering. Um, we launched the app on, on the Android store. It shot to number two, top paid, rated uh, parenting app with no marketing, didn't even tell anybody. It was number two, three days later. So does anybody have any questions about, about what I've, my career, yeah? Two part question, you talk about giving yourself a pass. Uh, uh -huh. When you do have that tough moment, and someone says, says no to you, how do you pick up from that? Clearly, you know, you don't take no very oh. easily. So I mean, what drives you, is it quiet time, is it spirituality? Yeah. Um, this, 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 this little phrase is, somebody dubbed me, I've been called a lot of things in, in my career. I mean, I've made, mostly worked with alpha males in the 20s, 20 year alpha male, all thinking they were Spielbergs, okay? It was very, very, very complicated business, uh, very emotional business, the video game business. Somebody, I was called the cleaner, because I would wipe out entire teams. Uh, uh, lightning boy, I got really fast at things. But I would, get, I would get people hating me. Um, but one guy came up to me and said, you're like, you're like an unstoppable force of nature. You just don't like, let anything stop you. So I kind of adopted that as my catchphrase for friendliness, to be an unstoppable force of nature. So I just, you know, when, when the door closes, you go through the window, they say that? Oh, no, no, I go over, under, or through that door. That's the way I think. Nothing stops me. If you really care about the things that you're doing in life, nothing stops you. Nothing. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if I'm in a box, cardboard box, I'm going to still be fighting my way back out of the box because what are we here for? I mean, our careers take up two-thirds of our life. Two-thirds of our life are dedicated to our occupations. We better hope that we care about what we're doing, that we have passion for what we do. Because if you, if you don't... If you don't have passion, you're not going to do very well. 
because you don't believe it. How could you possibly convince somebody else of what you're selling if you don't have that kind of drive, that kind of passion to over overcome it? So I just, I know that what I have is good. And I know that at the end of the day, it's, it's a win-win-win. Win for the parents, win for me, win for the kids. And everything that I try to do, if you go in with like an honest heart with people and you try to give them a good solid deal and you're not trying to shortchange them because Walt Disney, he said this, when you shortchange a customer, they know. And then it takes 10 times as much money to win them back. So don't shortchange people on the get-go and you'll get less no's because you were honest with them. You gave them a clear horizon as to what your plan was. Maybe that's a skill you lack, trying to figure out what that clear picture is. S Stephen gave it to me. You know, he knew what the clear picture was. I need to find things that people already wanted before I got there. That's his clear picture, and it's the thing that motivates him every time. Now, he's gotten older, not all of his movies have done very well because he's deviated from that. But I look at it as he's in his retirement age and he's just doing it because he wants to do it. He doesn't care about people liking it or not liking it anymore. But he did in his early career. He wanted to make a success at it. Any other questions? Yeah. Where do you find Friendly Uh It's both on the iOS and the App Store. It's a, Again, it's for three to seven year olds, but we're going to start creating um, uh, parenting. Uh, we're going to go to people like Helen. We're going to find out what inspires her. I'm building a, a thing called the School for Creatives, which will be exactly what I'm doing right here. So we can talk to parents and tell them how to uh, conquer obstacles, deal with stress, achieve their goals, and become an unstoppable force of nature for their families. So it'll be more than just for the three to seven year olds. So if you go to friend, L-I-E-N-S, friend Leon. So it's, it's actually a combination of two words, aliens and friend, because you know, friendly ideas are alien to kids right now, so we're <laughs> trying to get them back into the uh, being kind to each other. So, um, so yeah, you can get it on iOS and Apple, and we're also on Roku. So if you have a Roku TV, we have a little sampler, a handful of our cartoons on Roku, on the Gwen network. So you would have to install Gwen, and then you've got uh, the Friendly uh, Network and Groms. Two, two of my cartoons are on there as testers. We've got a few episodes. All right, are we, are we done? Thank you. <laughs>